Hi, I'm Holly. Uh, so this panel, we're going to be looking at examining the role of audience as co-storyteller and the impact of agency on our understanding and investment in factual stories. So to explore this, we have David Oppenheim, who uh, from the National Film Board of Canada, uh, producer of the space we hold. Uh, Michelle Fuerlich, head of digital at Keo. Uh, Andreas Duarte, producer at Ink Stories and of Blindfold and Michael Orwell, digital, uh, digital editor of the BBC and creator of Tell Me Your Secrets. Now, um, we were wondering very quickly about who was in this audience and how many of you are from an interactive background and how many of you are slightly a little bit apprehensive at the idea of agency, bringing agency into your storytelling. So, do we have any kind of game designers around? No, okay. Do we have interactive, digital? Okay, okay. And do we have anybody here who feels apprehensive at the idea of agency? Can we have a definition? Uh -huh. <laughs> we will be moving on to that. So yes, if you'd, uh, everyone would like to give a brief kind of one or two minutes on things you're working on at the moment, or things you've done to do with agency. So David, uh, okay. you'd like to start? <laughs> Uh, I work at the National Film Board of Canada. We're a public uh, producer, production studio. We've been, uh, uh, we've been a production studio, public, um, since 1939. So we've, uh, we've made things and continue to make documentary, auteur animation, um, documentary in various forms. We've um, won a few Oscars, a few Webbies, and we've made a bunch of clunkers, I'm sure, over <laughs> 70 years. Uh, we've made war propaganda, we've made a film called, I think, What is a Ladder? We've made ethnographic films, but we've also made community media. Um, for example, in the 1960s, a project called Challenge for Change. Uh, and then its follow-up, which was Filmmaker in Residence and High Rise, uh, which defined, I think, agency in, in, a, in a different way, uh, even sort of a process-driven way. Uh, the audience is a co-creator, so um, we've also made uh, feature docs like Stories We Tell that are creative hybrid docs. Um, I work in the Ontario studio uh, in Toronto. The focus of our studio is creative nonfiction uh, in various forms. Uh, we have at any one time 25 or so productions, uh, three producers. Each producer carries about eight to ten projects. Uh, my slate happens to be 75% um, interactive, 25% linear film. Um, I think just to give you a sense, because our studios do different things and it sometimes confuses people, uh, we do focus on creative nonfiction. Uh, you don't hear many definitions at our studio, but the one you might hear is uh, documentary defined as the creative interpretation of actuality. And that's just something that I think uh, defines a lot of the work we do, whether that's uh, a short film, feature doc, or um, uh, an immersive theater piece. So just in terms of the kind of projects that I've worked on recently that have some bearing on the panel, um, a project that we have here called The Space We Hold, which is a linear uh, web doc, um, where at a certain point, I mean, it's quite a linear uh, user experience uh, narrative, at a certain point, we go further and we constrain uh, the user's agency. Um, has anyone tried that in the... Uh... Yeah, good. You can tell me what you think uh, when we get lower down, because it's uh, curious in terms of our experience with agency. Um, worked on a project recently that will launch in June called Blood in the Soil. That is a, uh, a photo essay kind of in, in, in similar in form to The Last Hunt. Uh, which is one of my favorite NFB docs uh, prior to me joining, uh, or the NSA files by The Guardian, so mm -hmm. it's a different kind of user agency. Uh, also worked on um, recently Draw Me Close, which is a co-production with the National Theatre. I think I saw Toby or 2A here. Um, and that is a, um, a memoir uh, about playwright Jordan Tannehill's relationship with his mother after her uh, terminal cancer diagnosis, and that uh, kind of collides the worlds of um, performance, uh, animation, and uh, creative nonfiction. And so there's a, a set, a different set of kind of definitions and experience of agency in that one. Um, two more I'll just tell you about quickly. One is called Machinations. It's, we've developed a prototype. It's um, uh, room scale VR, and our team's taken to describing it as uh, a, a pilgrimage. 
in terms of user experience, or uh, Randall Okita, who is the filmmaker and installation artist. Um, he likes to describe it as uh, he's inviting you to his um, family dinner. The dinner happens to never sit around a table. He takes you on sort of what he calls uh, a, a pilgrimage of memory, exploring the idea of memory and recollection, but through the, the story of his grandparents who happened to be interned uh, because they were Japanese, and that was in our country, in Canada, uh, in case anyone has this idea that Canada's got an unblemished past and wonderful country. And then when I, uh, one last project is before I joined the film board, I worked on a database-driven documentary called Diamond Road Online, and that was in 2007. And uh, that was a user-directed documentary that used uh, 350 clips uh, to tell the story of the global diamond trade um, and an algorithm backend that was sort of an editor, in, uh, a real-time editor that based your movement through that story world on your decisions uh, of the previous clips you had watched and tried to s string a narrative together. Uh, and that was the last time I gave the user that much agency. Uh, so that's about it. Cool. Michelle? Hi, um, I'm Michelle. I, I guess I'm a producer of uh, digital storytelling projects. I, um, my career sort of began in, in television, so straight linear. Um, but I've, through the last sort of 15 years, really been interested in digital technologies and the application of digital technologies to narratives and, and storytelling. And uh, as technologies continue to evolve and change, how those, uh, together with sort of human behavior, can uh, combine to create really interesting stories. So um, I recently uh, produced for the BBC an interactive documentary uh, called Footballers United, which was uh, a World War I um, commemoration project, and uh, that had an element of agency in it. So we'll talk about the definition of agency afterwards, but the agency in that was the audience could choose which parts of the stories to consume. Um, it was quite linear, but it was also non-linear. Um, I have also produced quite a few games, so games are traditionally sort of seen as very agency driven. Um, I've, I've created interactive episodes for children's BBC shows. Um, I've also made uh, quite a few uh, transmedia storytelling projects which use social networks and platforms, different platforms to tell uh, character stories, mostly non-fiction and fiction stories as well, um, across those platforms. Um, I've also worked with um, Punch Drunk, bringing their uh, sort of very immersive, wonderful theater into the digital space. So we did a project together called Silver Point, where you were uh, drawn into the story through a addictive casual game, and then through the immersion within that game, you were taken into the real world and had both digital and real world experiences with uh, punch drunk actors. Um, I'm now uh, head of digital at Keo Films. We make uh, documentaries, really wonderful documentaries, and so we're exploring how to uh, bring digital technologies into those storytelling forms. Hi, everyone. I'm Andres. I'm from Ink Stories. Uh, previously, I was Vasiliki. Uh, we're basically the same person, so feel free to call <laughs> me Andres or Vasiliki. Um, we are a studio based in New York. We have uh, interactive um, content. We produce everything from games, VR, series, documentaries, um, long form. Currently, we have Blindfold at uh, Millennium Gallery, which is um, you know, human right violations on journalist work. And there's a big sense of agency there, so I can talk about it a little bit in, in a second. Um, also, last year, we had a um, hybrid video game, which we call Verite Game. Um, it's 1979 Revolution. It's based on the Iranian Revolution. So you are thrown into the chaos as a bystander, and you have the power to basically explore this world of revolution, of personal connections, of people's experiences through this time, and not only as a historical account, but, but more as a, the people's experience 
um, during during the revolution. Um, currently, we're working with um, with IMAX um, Star VR on a project called uh, Hero, and it's based on it's a room scale um, experience as a first person. Um, experience that puts you in in the city of uh, of Aleppo also, and you get to physically be in a world that is suddenly caught in you know it's in chaos, and you have the agency to help, you have the agency to make decisions, you have the agency to live in a world that many of us will never have a chance to live in locally. And I think it's it's really where the empathy engine really starts working for us, and that's really what is driving us um, right now as a company. Thank you. Mike? Hi, I'm Michael Orwell. I'm a digital development editor at the BBC. Um, I used to work for a part of the BBC called uh, Lab UK, which um, invited the audience to submit um, scientifically validated personal data about themselves um, and created these sort of online experiments um, and we, we sort of gathered about two and a half million cases of data across about 11 different projects um, and we would present back to people some, something about the data that they'd submitted to them um, straight away, straight away after the experience but um, what we'd also do is um, take all the data that we'd taken and give it to a, a, an academic researcher and they would try and discover something new from that data. Um, and one of the fruits of that project was um, the Great British Class Calculator, um, which I produced um, back in 2013, um, which defined a new social class for Britain. No biggie. Um, and uh, that was a big success. It was a collaboration with BBC News um, but it allowed people to see how they fit it into this quite sort of complex um, sociological construct um, that these super brains from Manchester and LSE had um, defined. Um, so, uh, and then I also did a project called um, Where in Britain Would You Be Happiest? Again, using um, three quarters of a million cases of data. Um, and that uh, allowed people to see how their personality traits um, and where they lived might define or predict their life satisfaction. Um, what I'm exhibiting here at uh, Sheffield is uh, Tell Me Your Secrets, um, which is in the Millennium Gallery uh, in the interactive room. Um, you can't miss it. It's like the world's biggest iPad stuck to a sort of <laughs> Dalek. <laughs> um, uh, but that is, um, I guess that's the first sort of overt um, piece of dramatic narrative storytelling, but it's still quite data-driven in a weird way because um, throughout the whole experience, um, every choice and consequence is, is tagged. And, and so I had the great pleasure a week after um, uh, uh, of, of publishing that, of being able to see all the different routes that people were taking through the narrative and all, all the decisions that people were making. But um, it's... Um, it's a, it's a piece which is a very unlikely kind of graphic novel, I suppose, um, about a sort of bespectacled scientist from World War II. Um, but I think it, um, it's a really important story, and it sort of, in a weird way, has defined quite a lot of the 20th century. Um, it, it started the special relationship between the UK and US. Um, and so um, I think most people seem to find it quite surprising and interesting, so hopefully you do too. Cool. Okay, so defining agency. Okay. What does agency mean to you as creators? No, does anyone have any ideas about that? Yeah, I think, I mean, for us, agency was always the juxtaposition of the storyteller and the storyteller in the player. So you don't want to just give a branch, a main branch of the, in this case, a, a game, a video game that is gonna take you through different, different scenes, different um, parts of the, of the story, but at the same time, you have the agency to veer from these main branches. And that's what we found it's extremely valuable because when you are having people interact with the content, when you're having people 
say, I don't want to go there. I want to do this, and I want to do it on my own terms, with my own pace. That's when people start learning more. We found out that with 1979, we brought a bunch of kids, and so the game is around two hours. So we put five kids in one room with the iPads with the game, and we put five kids in another room with an article on Iranian revolution. At the end, we brought everyone back, and guess who was able to tell us more about the Iranian revolution? So, obviously, no one. No, no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> the guys who played the game, they, because they were interacting with it, because they were able to remember things that they were reading and they were going in and doing. So, if the passiveness of the article, the, the people were not engaged. You know, it was a very passive thing, and they did not, have anything to contribute, and where in the game, they were learning by accident. So that's something that we discovered that was amazing. So that sense of agency to us is what really triggers knowledge, really triggers learning experiences that right now we need more than ever, and that right now with everything being so quick, like I heard um, the ladies before say, oh, it's only gonna take you 10 minutes. 10 minutes? That's a lot of time. Sorry, I'm not. I, I'm sure you're all going to do it, but you know, it's it's just a sense of like really putting putting the valuable time in in that specific thing that you really want to go in and go for the kill. So, I mean, um, the kind of idea of uh, agency, sort of globally speaking, as free will or the ability to resist, mm -hmm. is kind of a useful one that that I come back to, which is. I don't know, maybe more of a, a sociological definition, but I, I like that, the idea of free will, but then also the, you know, that includes the ability to resist. Um, two uh, sort of ways of looking at agency that we've um, started to sort of uh, use more and more in, in project uh, design development sessions. One is the idea of, of the labyrinth and the maze. And so um, in terms of uh, n metaphors for, for narration, or for, for narrative, sorry, um, the, the, the maze idea, you know, where, and that's most games where if you make a choice, it should lead to an outcome that is related to the choice. Uh, the labyrinth has that almost illusion of choice, but it tends towards experiences that are more contemplative where you feel like you are, you have agency, you are, are, are moving in some way, but you ultimately, every user, if they go to the end, they end up in the same place. Uh, so that's one. And then the other, which uh, since we've started getting our, our feet wet, is that right? Feet wet in, uh, in, in uh, VR at the moment anyway, um, is uh, the idea of local and global agencies, as someone you know, mentioned. Um, and that, uh, there's a guy named Kent Bai, if you haven't heard, he does kind of a nifty podcast on, uh, called Voices of VR. Uh, you should donate to his uh, criteria, no, what? Patreon? Patreon campaign, he mentions that every year. Uh, um, but it's actually very, he's, he's a good thinker on that, and he talks about the idea of a ghost with, um, a ghost without impact, uh, all the way to a character with impact. Um, and the idea of local agency where you can uh, design interactions for that user and those, that local agency allows you to make choices or make, take action that has an impact on your local environment but doesn't ultimately impact the narrative. Global agency being where your choices do impact the narrative. Mm. Um, and that's just been a really useful kind of continuum for creators, artists that we work with. Um, so that's, that's how we... Uh, I mean, there's so many different takes, but that's yeah. how we look at it. I mean, yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think there's, a, there's an idea of, of sort of bending the story towards you as well. Um, it's a really important part of, um, of audience agency and narrative. Um, it's almost like wrapping the story around you and seeing it from your point of view. Um, but there's always going to be this really large-scale global story that happens. You know, in, in Tell Me Your Secrets example, it's World War II. Um, but um, it's that experiential idea of um, being able to see the, the, the narrative unfolding from your perspective and actually do something about it and sort of think, well, how would I have done this differently? How would I, what choices would I have made at these points? And, you know, it can end up in a completely different place or it can just change the tone or the, or the tenor of, of it slightly. Um, 
But I think uh, the, the, the previous projects I did as well uh, are about, you know, there's a story about the sort of, for example, the social class construct of Britain. But it's being able to see it from your point of view and sort of being able, be able to see um, the agency to sort of uh, make that relevant to me and then I can then understand how the rest of it works um, is, is a way of understanding a story and, and sort of changing it and wrapping it around you, I think. I mean, I think there's lots of agency. Um, there's obviously the agency in, in traditional games where you are directing your path and choose, making multiple choices that lead to different endings. And I think factual storytellers get a bit scared of that because factual, <laughs> you know, there often isn't multiple endings. Um, so I, I sort of see agency in a slightly different way. So I, I'm very platform focused. So I see agency as influence and control over how I consume something. And that can be um, how I consume news on Twitter. So um, I see sort of what happened in Manchester a couple of weeks ago as um, that news story to me was a factual story that in which I had agency. So I consumed it all on Twitter. I chose which narratives I wanted to follow, which news sources I wanted to follow. I could engage with people affected. I could immerse myself in some way. I could donate. I could, you know, maybe not affect an ending, but have some influence or control over how I consumed that story and my input and feeling and immersion in that story. So I actually never watched a linear news story about that event. It was all done through consumption on social networks for me. So I think agency is, you know, as a, as a storyteller, as someone who looks at platforms and digital media and technology, um, especially emerging technologies like AR and VR, it is, a, a, agency exists there already. So, you know, you kind of have to uh, use those, uh, use them in your stories. You can't ignore them, essentially. Just to add, I think um, when I started at the film board three years ago, I, I came on halfway through a project called Universe Within, which was the final high-rise iteration. Uh, and that was a multi-year project that was um, led by uh, producer Jerry Flahive and Kat Sizik. And, um, you know, it's sort of, uh, I'd been following it and sort of a fan before I joined the film board. And um, uh, Kat would often talk about uh, the idea that um, you know, um, agency, I think, and this is my interpretation, but, you know, it, it extended not just to the uh, experience itself, but prior. So she talked about the people formerly known as subjects, and, you know, not every high-rise iteration, but some were um, enabled agency in terms of co-creation of story, uh, in terms of uh, participatory media, and so, um, you know, that was a pro, uh, largely a process-driven sort of definition, and so I think we can also look at agency uh, existing outside of the boundaries of, you know, the, the, the pieces that we create. Um, but I'm really curious, because I see a lot of familiar faces, but also non, and, you know, what, what uh, can we ask the, yeah, we can, why yeah. not? So what, what are some definitions that people sort of use for themselves in their work, or uh, if, if you don't create interactive stories, what sort of is your first impression or your existing impression of agency? Oh, okay. Would you, would you consider free bits of being interactive? Because I've often seen people, you've got people interactive. Oh, sorry. Um, so, like with VR, um, would you consider 360 being interactive because you can choose where to look or not? Would, can I? turn it around and ask you if you would? I mean, just, is that, is that for you as a user uh, an interesting, or, or do you feel like you have an agency that impacts or, or changes your experience? I think, it's, I think it's interesting when you're creating things because if you think that, you know, that you're embracing people being able to take that agency all the time, not trying to kind of direct them, that's, you know, it, it's quite interesting, yeah. I mean, I think we probably have different answers. Since I asked the question, I'll answer yours, but I mean, I think for me it's a continuum and, um, the agency there is on a, a limited scale. Uh, yes, I can, I can choose basically where to look in the sense of, uh, you know, I can choose in a linear film uh, where within the frame I'm looking. A good editor, and if 
anyone saw Walter Murch speak yesterday, he talks about guiding your eye across the frame. Um, 360, you don't have that frame, and so I do have the agency to look around, but I, I would just view that as a, a quite a limited form of agency compared to, let's say, some interactive um, VR or immersive or whatever definition you want to use where you can take action and there's some kind of outcome uh, feedback from the system. 360 film doesn't give me any feedback. Um, well, most, anyway. But. Yeah. yeah, other definitions or? Um, I was just thinking, I don't necessarily have my own definition, but I was just trying to get a frame of reference on it. Uh, and in response, for instance, to the question about 360, is that, is that uh, involve agency? I mean, 360 is more of a vicarious experience. And I think that's the point that uh, maybe helps us define agency. Uh, uh, there are a lot of VR and uh, immersive experiences that are vicarious in various forms, it could be a war zone or whatever. But obviously agency is where we begin to intervene and change the story, which could be making choices in a more specific way about uh, what we look at. But you know, it's a very gray area there as to whether that's just simply as we do in the real world, look around us, vicariously experiencing something we couldn't possibly in a physical context, or whether we're making decisions that change the story. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I think um, it, it doesn't really change the, the storytelling, perhaps, but it might change your feeling about being able to look in different places and, and being able to see different aspects of the shot and choose what you want to do and... Um, not feeling constrained by the frames that have been chosen for you, it might change the way you feel about it. So I think it might have a sort of a, an emotional change, perhaps, in, in the way that you consume the story. Um, but I, I still think it's a kind of agency. But um, I don't know if it if it changes the narrative. I mean, my, my brother is a computer scientist, and he um, he what he says he wants is he wants to, to be able to direct all sporting events himself. So he wants all the camera shots and then he'll decide when to flick between the ones that he wants, you know, turn off some of the commentators and things like that, which is a kind of agency, I guess, and he can then tell his own story, I suppose, by flicking between the shots himself and deciding what he thinks is interesting, which is, I guess, a way of, part of the way of telling the story. Yeah, I think, I mean, un unfortunately, the technology moves so fast that, you know, going back to the 360 being, having agency, you know, like now they're calling being called flatties, you know, because you're just sitting there and just like wibbling and, <laughs> and, you know, people are saying that it's not, it's not agency, but, but it is, you know, like I think it's still, it's, it's still pushing a boundary very much so. And, and I think um, something that we, with Blindfold that, that we did, that we wanted the bigger agency was how you're interacting in this world of an interrogation in Evin prison in, in Iran and how you're being, question and you're you're basically progressing your the story by answering yes and no and that's that's our agency that you know by just that simple mechanic we're we're trying to to put you in the shoes of someone else but at the same time like give you a sense of you will impact the story you know you will have two different outcomes at the end and and unfortunately, these outcomes happen to be real. So um, I feel like w when it comes to agency, you know, I think as storytellers is both being responsible and, and also trying to make sure that, that you're pushing your story the way you want. And a lot of the times, you know, you, you should let your story dictate the medium. You know, sometimes maybe VR is not for what you should do it, but maybe it's an interactive uh, graphic novel. You know, and, and I think that's the agency as, as creators that we should be looking, you know, turning it around and saying, what's going to be the best way to tell this story? And, and I think that's, that's a good question that we keep asking ourselves and keep like trying to motivate ourselves to keep changing. Yeah, I think, um, well, quite of the 360 projects I've seen shouldn't really be 360, they should be linear. Um, and for those, I don't think there is any real agency because you are supposed to look in a particular direction mm -hmm. and when you change 
your point of view, you're looking in the wrong direction and you're not having yeah. any, you're not having a good experience. So to me, that's a kind of bad use of that platform. But if you are making 360 projects and you are challenging where the user or the audience should look and what story they get from different perspectives, then that, that is a sense of agency. Yeah. I think maybe to turn the, sorry, the question around slightly into going to what is agency? What do you think? You all have a lot of experience working, uh, creating stuff. Now, what do you think makes a good experience for the, for the audience, for, the, or the, for someone who has agency? What do you think works well? What do you think perhaps doesn't work so well? Anything that you've learned on projects that you've kind of thought, well, maybe that didn't work out the way we thought? Yeah, um, my kind of big takeaway from all the stuff I've done is a lot of people don't actually want or don't want to expend effort in agency. So a lot of people who come from linear and move into digital are like, well, we'll just give them all the footage and they can choose what they want to watch and they can create their own narratives. People don't really want to do that. It's quite a lot of effort, effort for a factual filmmaker to make all those decisions. So I think it's, uh, it's for me, it's like that kind of um, intuitiveness of of storytelling, so taking um, the medium in which you're telling it, which could be many different digital platforms, but thinking how is a person going to feel when they use this? How are they going to, are they going to be pleased or disappointed or frustrated? And, um, and I always feel like the least amount of effort required to move through a story is the most successful. Even if they are making micro decisions along the way, they're not feeling like those micro decisions are an agony and, uh, you know, a something they have to do to progress the story, that the story will possibly naturally uh, unfold without their input, or if they do want to do certain things or they want to come into the story at a particular point. So that's what we did on Footballers United. We treated it as they are not going to come to this immersive interactive experience from the beginning to the end. That's just not how that audience works. Um, they consume content on Twitter and social platforms and they will find something on those platforms and come to the story from that and from that point the story has to make sense mm -hmm. and it has to make sense moving backwards and forwards and clicking on whatever they want to click on but it still has to be a, a story in which they can immerse themselves in with little effort. Yeah, I think, I mean, you nailed it in the head. I, I think it's very important to have story, you know, like by instinct we are we are a species that thrive on stories, like true stories, beginning, middle, and end. And I think when you have that, a strong structure in your story, you can allow yourself to have these branches and bifurcate you know, bifur in different directions. Because a good story, you know, like we are generally intrigued by them. And, and I think when, it's it's a very slippery slope when when you say okay yeah let's give agency but how much agency you know I think people say yeah agency agency but but as the creator you need to know how much because it's not the same thing um, to put a seed in the players or um, you know like a ex the experience and say. Um, oh, you, you can do anything you want. You have to be able to control that. You know, you are kind of in the Truman Show of where you're directing this, these feelings, these mechanics, and I think that's very important. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, it's, it's really important that people can make informed choices as well. So mm -hmm. I think some of the worst experiences I've had is where you're going along in a story and then they suddenly say, Right, are you gonna do are you gonna get in the speedboat or are you gonna um, try and drive? And I'm like, well, where am I driving? What what's the roads like? Uh, how choppy's the sea? Um, <laughs> well, you know, have I got a life jacket or you know, how can I make this decision? Um, and then if you get funneled off into something that, that then is a bad situation, you're like, well, God, geez, you know, <laughs> I'd have asked a few more questions if I'd had the opportunity. Um, so I think it's I think these choice mechanisms that you put into stories have to feel kind of genuine and something where you can sort of, yeah, I could probably take a punt on that. I reckon I can, I've got a feeling about what I should do here. Um, otherwise, it's, it's quite unfair, I think, on the audience. Um, yeah. I mean, I think uh, you asked about what makes it work. I'd say uh, intention is, is maybe the, the most important thing that, that we found is where uh, working with the creative teams, there's just sort of keep reminding ourselves that what is the intention of the decisions that we're making. Um, 
you know, one thing we kind of, uh, when the way we work is, is uh, you know, more often than not uh, creator or director driven, have to find better terms for those, but um, so when people come in, we, we act like, or perhaps I act like a two-year-old in asking sort of why, the questions of why, um, until we get to a point where there's just no feeling like, like this, this couldn't be a linear film. It, 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 would, you know, it has to be something else. Mm. And, you know, especially with teams that come from filmmaking um, or time-based, uh, you know, mediums mostly, is that, um, you know, we, we often talk about the idea of, of documentary as a representation, if, if, if documentary is a representation of the world, and Bill Nichols is a guy who writes about documentary, uh, kind of a, a book that has a title that's deceptively simple called Intro to Documentary, I think, but it's a good read. And he talks about how the fact that documentary is not an ala fiction, you know, unlike, it's not a fictional allegory, it's, n it's also not a reproduction of the world, but it's a representation. And so if documentary is a representation of the world, then a question we often ask is, uh, how does that representation of the world change if the user or audience is involved in the construction of that representation? And then, you know, once you sort of have that sense of, of uh, yes, there is, there is a reason for this to be interactive, then when you drill down into questions of agency, as long as it's done, well, not as long, there's lots of other things that have to come together, but if it is done with intention, um, about why and when, uh, then I, I find that that makes a huge difference in terms of uh, in terms of the end result. I mean, I think we also have to do the same things we all do in film or whatever art form. Fantastic team, um, you know, good story, well told or well experienced, uh, all of those things. But on top of that, we're, we're wrestling with that kind of agency butting up against story, but also agency allowing for more experiential um, work that, that, you know, maybe you're not saying, this is the story I told, I was told, but you're saying, you know, I did this, then I did this, and then I did that. Um, if anyone's played a game called Journey, I mean, I tried to describe it to my brother, and I couldn't tell him what it was about, but I could tell him what I did, and I could tell him who I met, and that I met this character who I felt was, you know, someone else playing online at the same time, and it was a magical kind of experience, but so, you know, in that case, I'm relating the story, but um, I think just we always go back to intention, and it's not to say we, we get it right every time, but. Sorry, I think we had a question. Yeah, this is a, an interesting um, idea around a passivity, which is to say that, you know, somebody who is experiencing interactive content, virtual reality, whatever, um, you know, how passive are they, how active are they? So, um, if our friends in the military here, I don't know if there's anybody from the military here. Um, you know, war games have been traditionally played in the military for, you know, forever. Um, and some of the most um, kind of sophisticated versions of virtual reality have been played out in the military. And the, you know, the agency that one, you know, like somebody who is going through those experiences get is a, is a direct thing. I think it relates, David, to what you're saying is, Outside the continuum of of this uh, experience, something else is going on. So, how passive are you? How active are you outside the continuum? I think that's a really very you know very identifiable part of this whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, just to say, I think there's dif different kinds of uh, audience members or users, or if you prefer the term verp, which is a term I discovered from a game prof. It's, it sounds really, it's fun to say, actually. What, what, what is it again? It's called a verp, which is oh, viewer, uh, user, reader, player. Um, and it, 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 um, in working with the uh, National Theatre, I think uh, Toby, I'm not sure if he's here, but uh, would often say how much he hates the word user. He sort of wants us to talk about audience because it's mm -hmm. got a, I mean, I think it's just... I don't know, user has a very product feel, but yeah. we ended up talking around uh, this idea of a verp, but just to add to your point, I think it, it, there's very different types of verps or users and, and outside of that continuum and the, and, the, and the spaces that we construct, I mean, it, it's what you bring to it as well and it's kind of where you go. It's just, you've had your hand up. Yeah. Uh, it just strikes me that um, we're, talking, we're talking a lot about um, sort of thought agency rather than body agency. And 
uh, certainly in a lot of the work that we make, and it would be really nice to hear more from you guys, just how um, choices that the body can make rather mm -hmm. than the mind have an impact on the way I feel in a story and the way that I, or an experience or whatever it is, and uh, the impact that can have on kind of narrative and, and, and feeling all the way through things. Because in my experience, uh, agency over my body is like kind of infinitely mysterious and exciting in, inside something. An agency over my thought or hmm. narrative choices, I actually don't really enjoy. Can you give an example of, I unfortunately didn't experience Door into the Dark, but can you give an example of, let's say two different on the continuum where you had agency or you or, or someone you created an experience for where they had more and then when they had less agency? Yeah, so I, I won't talk about Door into the Dark because it will sound <laughs> irritating. Um, but there's a beautiful piece that was made by an, uh, an artist called Tanya al Khori um, called Garden Speak, where you arrive at a theatre and you are given a sort of long Macintosh and then you're let into a very dark room, probably about a third of the size of this room, and a, a kind of a sort of graveyard has been made with uh, wooden graves and th the floor is covered in earth and you're given pieces of paper with names in Arabic script written on them and the graveyards are all um, have each one of these names on. So you go and you, you lie down in front of the grave and you lie on the ground and you put your ear to the ground and you hear the story of uh, somebody that was buried in their garden because mm. in Syria... People can't be buried in cemeteries anymore because it's too dangerous. So people are burying their loved ones in their gardens. Mm. So the kind of action of like you walking in, you lying down, you burrowing in the earth, you and in the end you sort of you write a little note to the to the person and to their family and you bury it in the ground. And there are other notes that other people have written there as well. And just in terms of you know I have control over my pace. I have control over like. What am I doing with this earth? Am I like putting it on my face? Am I lying down? Am I rolling mm -hmm. around? And that kind of that quality of experience, like the story is completely linear, but like mm -hmm. my feeling about it is just completely different. I think it's a great point. Uh, one of my favorite um, interactive experiences is it was a prototype, and it was uh, 2001. It was uh, something I saw at the uh, Media Lab, or what was then called the Interactive Art and Entertainment Program at the Canadian Film Center. And it was a piece called Tightrope. Um, it was about uh, a family of tightrope walkers called Flying Willendas. Do you know it? Yeah. Wow, that's cool. Um, and it could have been just a, a, you know, something you experienced sitting at a computer, but um, the creators decided that you would need to walk up. Um, they had a, a table that you had to stand uh, up to. Um, and it was a linear story. It was about this family that uh, of, of, you know, a father, uh, all of his kids, like seven tightrope walkers. And this one fateful day, uh, they were doing this high wire act. Um, two family members fell to their death. And it's a story that starts and puts you on the tightrope. Um, and they just simply asked the user and constructed an experience that you walked up, you were standing, the interaction design was simply you toggled arrows that, that, that um, controlled the, the stick, the, the balancing beam. Um, and depending on how you were able to do that, the, the story that the father was telling you in your ear um, and the sound of the wind and all of that would change significantly. Um, and you couldn't change the outcome. You, you ultimately felt your death. But there was something physical about, uh, you know, that made a huge difference. Um, I won't talk about it, but, uh, but Draw Me Close, which we just sort of finished the first chapter of, we, we really had a lot of fun uh, dealing with those questions of physicality. And, and um, I think it can be really powerful in terms of the, the, the overlap between that physicality, um, even, you know, as you say, with a linear story where you're coming to the linear story, but your, your choice of how you get into it and whether you bend down on the, on, you know, on the ground to draw with the mother or you, you, know, you stand up or, or how you react, but... Yeah, quite a few of the projects I've worked on, we've, we've worked with theatre makers um, because digital is a vis can be a visceral experience and an intuitive experience. And I actually think quite a lot of the behaviours you have in digital are human behaviours. You know, you, 
the way you swipe on your phone becomes a, a second nature to you. And I'm quite interested in, in, in how your gestures and how things you, you intuitively do can play into the user experience of what you make. Um, so I've, you know, I've done a, um, a sort of audio-only binaural game, which was very much led by a, a team of uh, theatre producers because they understood how you move through spaces. Essentially, we uh, there was Papa Sangre. Oh yeah, yeah wow, you did that. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. That's great. If anyone hasn't seen that, Papa Sangre. Can't see it. You can only hear it. <laughs> oh, sorry. Papa yeah. Sangre. Papa Sangre, it's an audio-only game, so it's binaural. So you put headphones on and you move through spaces that are audio soundscapes. But it's a game, it's a horror game, so you have to sort of get to things and yeah, monsters fantastic. chase you and, and the like. Um, so yeah, I, I'm fascinated by the, the visceral experience. And I do think, you know, I mean, with new technologies, that's becoming more possible now. Um, I, you know, I've been doing some development into the idea of uh, VR-driven storytelling through body reactions. So through the, you know, I mean, obviously the technology's not there yet, but through the temperature of your skin and your heartbeat and how that can push a story forward. Because I feel like, as I said before, you know, you don't want to have to make decisions all the time. But if your body's making those decisions for you, or if you're feeling something and the story, you know, transforms according to how you're feeling, that's really interesting to me. Yeah. Is that a lack of agency or agency if it's responding to your... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting you say that, yeah, because for us, for Blindfold, we, we started um, thinking, how, how can we bring this interactivity, like physical interactivity to the to experience? So the nodding, the shaking, it, it's, it's such a, like, you know, very basic um, way of responding, and, and in itself, it just becomes an innate feeling when so when you're in the experience you really are just you know just shaking yes nodding no well, the other way around um, so it we started discovering that people were one of the two either not wanting to respond to see what would happen or the other one it was not understanding what um, what the experience was and and I think it's also kind of like a like a entry point like trying to educate how we're trying to make these experiences seamless, but at the same time, we're so used to seeing UI, right? Like, we're used to seeing, like, a little thing that pops and says, like, oh, you did this, or no, you didn't. So, like, when, when you start getting in, inside these experiences and it becomes a seamless experience, I think is when f the physicality really becomes something part of it and it really gives you extra sense of of agency, so like in in a way, like for for us, if you don't respond, you're prompted. You know, you say like, "Why are you not responding?" So tell like, or or if you respond too soon, it tells you think about your answers before you respond. So I think it's it's to me, it's really interesting just to see how people are moving, even their their body language. You know, some people will go like this, and some people will like try not even respond because it also becomes a self-conscious method you know like there's I have this thing on and people are watching me so like how how much should I interact with it and I think it's also important I get very self-conscious in VR and you know it's saying like moving things and and touching and I think it's it's part of it and if you're making that part of the experience it's also you know it's it's valid I, I think it's it's just natural I, mean, yeah. I thought it was so much better than a clicker, though. You know, yeah. Imagine if you were trying to respond to the interrogator just with a clicker, yes, no. You would be completely unengaged, but exactly. by having to move my body in response to his questions, you know, I felt like I was really inhabiting that person's body, mm -hmm. and it mm -hmm. sort of made it more terrifying, you know, that yeah. what was going to happen to me. I think we, have, yeah, we probably have time for one more question, if there's someone up here. Um, yeah, so um, thanks, thanks for all the interesting talks. I, I just want to kind of throw something um, out there. I, I, I'm slightly skeptical of the word agency, um, because I think it's a very loaded word, and, um, and I'm kind of saying that because I think there's one, the interact, the, the kind of the user experience within the practice, but also, especially with the context of projects we see here, is about the, the bigger social issues that they're trying to sort of deal with. And I wonder, and I don't, 
particularly think that the word needs to be replaced with a different word because I think that might be the problem. And I wonder if within the context of different projects, it can, different words can be used to kind of mean the same thing. So for example, there were like a choi like choice, simple choice or visceral experience, or I don't know, like simple, simpler words needs to be used in that context. And I wonder what your take on that is. Thank you. you can I just ask a clarification question? You, you mentioned, if I heard you correctly, uh, and uh, what I understood you to say is that there's maybe a problematic nature to the word agency with respect to certain projects and, and issues around representation, or did I totally miss that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think particularly, so uh. I was thinking generally, yes, I, I think the uh -huh. word agency is, is a very low, I think it's a very loaded word. There's, there's a lot of kind of connotations that comes, comes with it, and especially in, in the, and I was thinking particularly in the context of works that are presented here, which are all about bigger social um, issues, then kind of I think that problem becomes even, yeah. <laughs> can, can you can you speak about an, an example or just if it, you know? Um, yeah, I mean I, I think like for example with, with um, just just because I, the only work that I've experienced is the blindfold. Sorry, I don't mean to sort of be <laughs> big on that project, but but I think you know like um, after I, I I experienced that work, I wasn't sh sure sort of sort of my, my role as the audience within the kind of bigger context of what the reality of the of the situation is means and I think okay the age I, I didn't particularly feel like a sense of agency but I just felt like I had a choice um, and I yeah so that's kind of I don't know if I've explained this further or is more clear yeah I think um, and maybe I'm, I didn't understand it but this is this will be my agency in trying to respond to it. Um, no I think I, you're totally right I when when it comes to really making these more serious answers, you know, there's, there's a sense of, I, I want to say responsibility, um, that, that you really need to advocate like certain um, ways of, of really dealing with how you're going to ask people to do it, right? So, so in, in a sense, I don't know, maybe, let me, let me think about this for a second, I'll I, hit I, you up. I <laughs> I, I tend to agree with you. I think agency is a bit of a catch-all sort mm -hmm. of term that, that sort of embodies lots of different things about, you know, and has so much degree to it. So, you know, in, in, in Andreas' game, I wanted to break out of my bounds and beat the guy up and run out the door, you know, but I couldn't do that, unfortunately. I just had to take it, you know. Um, but I, I know what you mean. It's, there's, there's so much... Um, sort of latitude there about wh how much choice you've got in any uh, interaction. And so, I, yeah, I think you're right. Maybe for different, for different types of media, we should probably use a more exact term, which I mean, is... The, you know, the space we hold, which is a project that, that, that I have here with uh, our team has here, um, we got into trouble a lot. We, we actually had, uh, you know, a lot of difficult conversations with uh, subjects, with, with people who were involved in uh, violence against women uh, issues, who were involved in fighting militarized sexual violence. In part, because of that, the, and just mm -hmm. sort of the, the particular uh, interaction mechanic, which is when you are watching a testimony, and this is a project that, that sort of is a provocation to witness testimonies of three grandmothers who were former comfort women, um, uh, comfort women, a term being used by the Japanese military in World War II for young girls up to over 200,000 that they, they uh, captured and, and enslaved. Um, and, you know, the idea that we were giving the user or the verb some agency, uh, but then taking that away and asking them to essentially commit or to demonstrate attention by, you know, the only way you can watch the testimony is by pressing the space bar and holding that down. And, you know, uh, the conversation that the team was using prior to it launching was around how we witness, um, how we deal with testimonies. Um, and there were not, you know, there were a few conversations around the role of the documentary subject and the idea that, you know, who has agency, the power dynamics of creation, um, you know, um, sort of a bit, a bit tricky territory. And I'm, I'm not sure if that's, you're going that far, but... You know, the, the word agency, when you think of it as a social or political term, free will, etc. I mean, we all have free will, no matter what the film is or the documentary, but the, the, the subjects often don't, and how it's represented and played out in the world. So, I agree, it can be, it can be a loaded term, and we, we, we should always re-examine our terminology and language. But 
There's a woman who up there has had her hand literally uh, for like 20 minutes. Can we get to her or am I? Oh, I'm, I'm really sorry to cut it short. <laughs> I'm, I'm so sorry. Let her, let her. <laughs> Shout it out, shout it out. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk after the panel. <laughs> I hate to be uh, the bad guy and cut it short because that is so interesting and I'm sure we could all listen and hear you speak about this for a lot longer. Um, but if you hadn't had the chance to go to the Millennium Center and go and try out things, and I would highly recommend you do, there's some brilliant stuff there. But I'd like to thank the panelists thank for coming you. along. Thank, thank you, you so much. <laughs>